Thank you so much, Sue. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, <clears throat> and I thank everyone for joining in the middle of a blizzard or with this unexpected snowstorm. Um, but I hope everyone is excited to hear about this. This is something I am very passionate about. And first comes first, I have no disclosures for my talk today, other than I actually suffer from imposter syndrome on a regular basis. And in fact, I suffered from this earlier today when preparing for this talk, which is something I have given to many different audiences. So it's interesting that it came up for me even before talking about this. So my objectives for this evening's session is to define what imposter syndrome or phenomenon is and how it presents in ourselves and in others, how we can recognize and reflect on times when you've experienced imposter syndrome and design and formulate a plan for coaching yourself or a colleague when you next experience this or when you see it in others. So let's dive in and see what we're talking about. So by definition, an imposter is a person who pretends to be someone else in order to deceive others, especially in a fraudulent game. Now, when you think about this and this concept, when people act or feel as if they're an imposter, it's not meant to be hurtful. But and you're really not having this alter ulterior motive to deceive someone else either. Oftentimes, it's something completely different. So now if we think about the other part of this syndrome, it's a group of symptoms consistently that occur together or conditioned by a set of associated symptoms. So speaking as this, we've actually pathologically made this into a problem. So we actually have now something that we can label and see and recognize as an actual pathological problem. Now, this could be something that you're like, oh, this isn't a big deal. Well, actually, it really is. So we're going to watch this brief video just to give you a better idea of what this means and how it presents in other people. Even after writing 11 books and winning several prestigious awards, Maya Angelou couldn't escape the nagging doubt that she hadn't really earned her accomplishments. Albert Einstein experienced something similar. He described himself as an involuntary swindler whose work didn't deserve as much attention as it had received. Accomplishments at the level of Angelou's or Einstein's are rare, but their feeling of fraudulence is extremely common. Why can't so many of us shake feelings that we haven't earned our accomplishments or that our ideas and skills aren't worthy of others' attention? Psychologist Pauline Rose Clance was the first to study this unwarranted sense of insecurity. In her work as a therapist, she noticed many of her undergraduate patients shared a concern. Though they had high grades, they didn't believe they deserved their spots at the university. Some even believed their acceptance had been an admissions error. While Clance knew these fears were unfounded, she could also remember feeling the exact same way in graduate school. She and her patients experienced something that goes by a number of names. Imposter phenomenon, imposter experience, and imposter syndrome. Together with colleague Suzanne Imes, Clance first studied imposterism in female college students and faculty. Their work established pervasive feelings of fraudulence in this group. Since that first study, the same thing has been established across gender, race, age, and a huge range of occupations, though it may be more prevalent and disproportionately affect the experiences of underrepresented or disadvantaged groups. To call it a syndrome is to downplay how universal it is. It's not a disease or an abnormality, and it isn't necessarily tied to depression, anxiety, or self-esteem. Where do these feelings of fraudulence come from? People who are highly skilled or accomplished tend to think others are just as skilled. This can spiral into feelings that they don't deserve accolades and opportunities over other people. And as Angelou and Einstein experienced, there's often no threshold of accomplishment that puts these feelings to rest. Feelings of imposterism aren't restricted to highly skilled individuals either. Everyone is susceptible to a phenomenon known as pluralistic ignorance, where we each doubt ourselves privately but believe we're alone in thinking that way because no one else voices their doubts. Since it's tough to really know how hard our peers work, how difficult they find certain tasks, or how much they doubt themselves, there's no easy way to dismiss feelings that we're less capable than the people around us. Intense feelings of imposterism can prevent people from sharing their great ideas or applying for jobs and programs where they'd excel. At least so far, the most surefire way to combat imposter syndrome is to talk about it. Many people suffering from imposter syndrome are afraid that if they ask about their performance, their fears will be confirmed. And even when they receive positive feedback, it often fails to ease feelings of fraudulence. But on the other hand, 
Hearing that an advisor or mentor has experienced feelings of imposterism can help relieve those feelings. The same goes for peers. Even simply finding out there's a term for these feelings can be an incredible relief. Once you're aware of the phenomenon, you can combat your own imposter syndrome by collecting and revisiting positive feedback. One scientist who kept blaming herself for problems in her lab started to document the causes every time something went wrong. Eventually, she realized most of the problems came from equipment failure and came to recognize her own competence. We may never be able to banish these feelings entirely, but we can have open conversations about academic or professional challenges. With increasing awareness of how common these experiences are, perhaps we can feel freer to be frank about our feelings and build confidence in some simple truths. You have talent, you are capable, and you belong. Everyone can use a little extra kick of confidence sometimes. Find out some tips and tricks for boosting yours with this video. All right, so I thought this was a really good summary and recognizing that this is something that is pervasive pretty much in every sector. So regardless of what you do or where you live or where your training has brought you, this is something you probably have seen or experienced yourself. So why do we call it a syndrome? Is it really a problem with us? So let's kind of look at these different graphs that may actually help put it into a different perspective for you. So initially, when you see this graph, you'll think that there's a pie chart that you fit into. And actually, when we look deeper at it, it's the green represents people who get imposter syndrome. Orange is other people who get imposter syndrome as well. And blue is literally everyone else. They also get imposter syndrome too. So everyone at some time will feel this and it's okay. And that's one of the parts about this that I've oftentimes people segregate themselves thinking that they're different when in actual fact we have more in common about this than you would believe. Another way to think about this is who you think you are and then who others think you are. And it's a very different view and lens when we often view this. So how you view yourself, an awkward, crazy mess of an individual who tries too hard to impress people and has no talent. But what actually if you look at the other side of the coin, what people think about you is someone who's actually a really cool person. So how does this translate into the way we think about what we know and how our life experiences really make us who we are? So oftentimes the way to think about imposter syndrome is that what I know and what we actually think what others know. And it's disproportional the way you see it, that you think you don't know enough and that everyone else knows substantially more knowledge and that they're an expert and you know nothing. When in actual fact, what you know is the exact same size as others. It's just that your knowledge gap is different and they overlap. And so that what you can see here is you actually know a little bit about the same things that many people know. It's just their level of knowledge is different than yours based off of your life experiences, previous places of employment, and other things that you've done in your life. And the reality is that we don't see this in the moment. So now you may be saying, all right, this is a woman who's highly educated. She has no idea what I'm talking about. She can't relate to me at all. So what does this actually look like in healthcare professions? So there's a young gentleman named Mike Natter who's on Instagram who writes about this and draws graphic medicine about this. And I'd like to share some of his work with you today. So this is the progression as we go through medicine, a medical student and a medical resident. This is a medical student thinking, oh God, I'll never know as much as my resident. And then the medical resident is saying, oh, God, I hope my med student doesn't know more than me. This happens on a daily basis. And as you can see, this happens in men just as much as it happens in women. Now, you may think when someone has graduated from residency, this goes away. Well, I'm here to tell you as an attending physician that it does not. And this really interesting graphic medicine piece will show you this as well, too. Oh, God, I'll never know as much as my attending is what the medical resident is saying. And the the attending is saying, oh, oh, no, I hope my resident doesn't know more than me. And on a daily basis, these thoughts will come in and pervade someone in the, the middle of doing something else, and they will question themselves. Now, what does this even look like even further? And this is his Instagram, if you'd like to follow him. He's talking about this monster, not the good green monster at Fenway Park, one that just sits on our back eating chips, looking at what we're doing every day. And it creates a culture of fear and self-doubt. And will this ever be a heavy load that I won't have to shoulder? So the more that we kind of let this fester and not actually self-reflect upon this, it can get bigger and bigger 
and ultimately can change how we practice, how we take care of ourselves. If we put ourselves out there for a promotion or a new job, if it's out of our comfort zone, if we take care of our friends and our family differently because we don't think we know how to. So this is something that really can affect every aspect of your life. So you may be thinking, well, this doesn't happen in other places. So I want you to see these are the Harvard Business Review most downloaded articles in 2021. One is entitled End Imposter Syndrome in Your Workplace. And the other one is Stop Telling Women They Have Imposter Syndrome. They're both by the same authors. And they have some very interesting facts in them that I'd like to share with you. So as mentioned in the video, in February 1978 is when the initial studies about this were done by Clance and Imes. And it was done in high-achieving women. This sparked a revolution in how leadership training was done and initiatives were done for women to reduce their risk of developing imposter syndrome. But interesting part about this, when they actually expanded their study in real life, men and women both equally experience imposter syndrome. But what's less explored is why this occurs and why does this exist in the first place? What role are our workplaces fat, you know, fostering this? And how is it being exacerbated? It also impacts and is reflective of systemic racism, classism, xenophobia, and other biases that we're unaware of even existing. And the initial concepts of imposterism didn't even examine those because they didn't know it was part of this. So what I challenge now is to recognize that this is more than just one aspect of us. It is many aspects of us. And we can't look at imposterism on just the individual without looking at deeper dives into our institutional structures that are in place. So this follow-up article that's on the left from 2021 in July focuses on fixing the workplace. And I would challenge you all, if you don't take anything else other than this, is to go back and look at your place of work. Think about how we can work and push towards a more sustainable system Create solutions to ensure our workplace is where our most underrepresented employees can actually belong and thrive and recognize from this how we can start to look for and see when we see it in our colleagues and how we can break these systems and rebuild them so that way imposterism isn't part of this as well. So thinking about that, I want to take a moment for you to consider a time when you felt like an imposter. And in the question and answer, please write any questions you have about those examples. I'm going to leave this up for a minute and then I'll stop sharing just so you can all, um, we can pull up the question and answer. We can go through them for a moment. So think about, take a moment to consider a time when you felt like an imposter. And what specific questions do you have thinking about that? All right. How do you acknowledge and frame your ignorance with others or without risking reputation and credibility? That's a really great question. So I would like to reframe this to thinking about acknowledging your own biases and reframing your own, like you said, your ignorance. So one of the first steps is to just acknowledge that you don't, you know, don't know everything and recognizing that how we can start to consider our own imposterism and how this affects others is just talking about it just like that video mentioned as well. So how can we do that? By modeling that behavior. So I often do this with my colleagues, with people I'm training, people who are above me, um, because I want them to see that this is something that's really important. And so oftentimes when I'm feeling like an imposter, and that I don't belong. I often will say it out loud. You know, I'm feeling really, and you know, unsteady on my feet before I do this presentation. Or I will say, has anyone else ever felt like this before? And you would be amazed how many people will do this. And what I found, instead of actually risking my reputation or my credibility, it's actually amplified this. And I will then see this in someone else and bring it to their attention. And they're like, well, what do I do now? And it's actually, we're going to go through some tangible steps later on in this presentation to go through this. But most oftentimes when you acknowledge this and own this, it actually will increase your credibility because you're showing not that you're completely vulnerable and that you don't know what the heck you're doing, but that you're actually saying that 
I know a lot of things, but I'm acknowledging the fact that I'm still learning. What are the signs and symptoms that you can see in your colleagues and yourself to kind of say, oh, I need to maybe take a step back and see what's going on? So when we think about this, this is the employee of the month. You can see they're sweating, they're red, they're very uncomfortable, their shoulders are shrugged. So looking for body language is a first sign. Also, the sensation of afraid of being outed as a fraud. When I started my job now almost four years ago, every day I would come home and say to my family, I'm pretty sure I'm going to get fired tomorrow. They're going to realize I'm a fraud and I have no idea what I'm doing. And I would say it that fast and I would just blurt it out. I would be on a committee for uh, an organization and I would say the same thing. They have no idea. I have no idea why they picked me. I'm not even supposed to be here. And so this idea that oftentimes people will say that they have been lucky to get everything, that they are someone who just happened to be the right place at the right time, and that someone's going to figure out that they don't know what they're doing. Also, when people do get awards, like this person in the graphic is getting, they feel unworthy of success. I don't deserve this. No one else applied who was better than me. I just happen to be the only candidate they would consider giving this to. They downplay their success, and they often view it as that it's not something to be proud of and that it's something that actually just happens to be a thing that happened, that they're unworthy of acceptance of praise or accolades and that they feel very, very uncomfortable. Dismissive of positive feedback. So has anyone ever been given a really great compliment or feedback from a colleague who we work with or a friend or a family? And they're like, oh, no, no, you're being too nice. and It's really one of the first things that I watch for when someone says that to me, because then as soon as I've heard them say that once, I then watch for additional signs and symptoms of imposterism. Oftentimes people don't trust others because of the same fact. If you tie these together, oh, I don't believe you. You're just, you're saying that to be nice. And then the other part of it is over-preparing. So I have given this talk many times to a variety of different people, and every time Right before I give this presentation, I re-review it, like for a half an hour before I'm going to give the talk. I, whenever I give a presentation, I oftentimes will, or even when I'm just writing something up or doing something, I will spend hours and hours and hours over preparing when I've already know all the stuff that I'm supposed to talk about or the things I'm supposed to do. It is one of the things that can actually lead people to really feel like they are in the cog of the wheel. Because they are so much that little hamster spinning on that wheel. And it's ultimately one of the things that you can do if you see your colleague doing this and say, you know, you got this. We're going to be there together to support you and have their back as much as they need it. So now thinking about this, um, we're going to actually go into this deeper dive now. And we're going to take the next 20 minutes or so to go through these steps. And so the first thing I want you to think about when I read this off to you is, how do you talk to yourself? There is so much negative self-talk out there in the world, and much of it is actually ourselves in our own head. And so think about this and reframe how you talk to yourself. I want you to talk to yourself like you would talk to a child. It's okay to be sad. I'm here for you. I won't leave you alone your best friend. You rock. I am so proud of you. You deserve the best. You're worth every single dollar I invest in you, your favorite treat that you may be eating right now. The sun, you light up my day and you warm my soul. Your favorite pet, you are the cutest thing I've ever seen or a stranger. Would you like me to help you with that? How often have you spoke to yourself like that? Probably not that often, right? Whereas if it's your same If it's your best friend going through the same situation, you would speak to them in a much kinder way. If we aren't kind to ourselves, we can't be kind to others. And in the world that we live in now, kindness is the most important thing for ourselves, especially. So what I'd like for you all to do is grab a piece of paper and write out a self-reflection on each of these. So we have 20 minutes now to do that. Um, And so what we'll do is I'll read these out. I'm going to leave the screen up. And I want you to take the time to really do this and give yourself the ability to think. So the first one is to think about a time when you felt like an imposter in the past 
and how you dealt with it. Think about the way you talk to yourself and what worked well, what didn't work well. And so the second part for each question is, how did you break the cycle and what tools did you find successful? Now for question two, is there a current or present imposter syndrome event you are struggling with? What's actually happening? View this in a non-judgmental way and give yourself grace. Do not beat yourself up. Do not be your own worst enemy. Think about those acts of being kind. And then the last one is, think of a time when you witnessed someone else with imposter syndrome. How could you have helped them? Or how can you help them if you see this happen again? So I'm going to leave this up and I'm going to put a timer. So we will go until 640. Um, So take the time to go through this. And then I'm going to mute myself, but I will be able to, if there's questions that come up, we can, you can write them in the Q and A and then I will see them. Um, But I'll leave you for this. I really want you to take the time to go through this. All right. I think we're going to end a little early just because I realize we have probably, you've probably gone through all of these. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen again. And I'll leave some space now for, I'd love to hear what came up in the question and answers. Um, What are some things you're working through and what are some things that you want help with navigating that came up when you reflected upon these areas? And now I want everyone to know that this is something that comes up for everyone, Um, be it about work being a parent, being a friend, um, being a colleague, trying something new, and it can come up in any aspect of your life. So please don't hesitate to ask the questions you have. I want to be able to help you navigate these. When in a higher level position, it feels as though there is no choice but to fake it and hope your feelings diminish over time. Yes. So there is a phrase, the fake it till you make it. Um, but I like to change it till you fake it till you are it. So oftentimes you can then model the behavior of, I really don't know what I'm doing and have no shame with that. So, um, being in a higher level of position, especially as a woman, it makes it much more difficult to feel like you're not under the microscope being screwed, you know, having lots of scrutiny about everything that you do. One of the things that I have found to be the most beneficial being in a position of power, especially as a woman, is to actually talk out loud about this. Because what you will come to realize is that not only do you feel that way, but your colleagues do and other people who are in positions of power. I recently gave this talk um, to a larger, to a different portion of the organization. And a number of men who were in positions of power also came up to me and said, I always just thought I had to fake it till I make it. And so it's a really interesting thing and it is something that it may not diminish, but it may change over time. So for instance, the first time I gave a presentation on Zoom to a national organization, I completely felt petrified that I had no idea what I'm doing. And preparing for this, the platform was the least of my worries now. So the levels of learning that you can help yourself with when you're feeling this actually will make you a stronger leader. And you were going to go through some of those techniques as well too, after we're done with this part. Thank you so much for sharing. And it definitely is something that the higher you go up, you would think it would go away, but it actually, it's the exact opposite. All right, I'm going to go back and share my screen. So now what do we do from here? So How can we change our workplace or coach others? So one is to pivot the language we use with our employees or our friends or our colleagues and how we describe themselves. Share your own experiences, just like I mentioned about being in a feeling of imposter and highlight the conditions that triggers your response. So for instance, I have a tendency to feel like an imposter if I think people are talking about me and that they are not going to tell me what's wrong. And then all of a sudden I'm going to get fired. And so what I realized was, is that if I'm going to get feedback from my boss or someone who's superior to me, I like to know it now. I don't want to wait three days. 
So I've actually talked about this with my boss and now they will give it to me, like the feedback that I need for growth very soon instead of days later. There's so many different ways that people will ruminate and create the worst case scenario in their head that it can be detrimental to them. Oftentimes, if you're seeing this in yourself or others, probe about their experiences that have led to this and don't discount that and also recognize they often discount their successes. It's the little wins that make for big successes. And so by honoring those little bits every day that come up, um, it will allow for their feelings of not belonging to go down as well, too. Be honest about the impact of biases. Discrimination and bias can shape our expectation, and we may not even realize this. That's why they're called unconscious biases. If those come up, honor them, look into them, probe how you may not have even seen those over there until someone else pointed them out for you. If we acknowledge these and recognize that we often are biased without even knowing it, we can create culture change within our institutions and our organizations we work in even at home. And also, we must broaden our definitions of what it looks like to be a leader, a teacher, a mentor, and a sponsor, and recognizing that oftentimes we are teachers every day. We are leaders every day, and we are mentoring and sponsoring others without even realizing it and how we can actually do this much more. This will help when you say that one time to that person who never thought to apply for that job, you'd be great at that. And then they'll downplay it. And now you'll have this language to say, what do you mean? Why do you feel that way? And it'll actually give them an opportunity to think outside the box of what they're capable of. Also, be data-driven and rigorous. Given that a specific example, like I just said, if someone says to you, well, I don't have the ability to do this, but you know that they've run a successful meeting, they have motivated others, they've taken on a project and knocked it out of the park. It's an amazing way for you to then feed it back to them and be like, look, there's no data to support any of the stuff that you just said. You should actually consider this because of this, these facts. It allows for them to understand where they're coming from, but it also helps you understand those who are around you better. And the last thing is to listen. Listening to people makes such a difference, especially now. You know, put your phone away, put all the other technology away, and just listen to what people are saying. They'll say what they need and it'll make it a better place for you to be. So the last thing we're going to do is something called the recipe for success. Um, What I want you to do is take a moment now to review the positive things that helped you break the cycle of your imposterism. Think about what your personal mantra will be, what resonates with you. So for instance, mine is do not let other people dull your sparkle and shine. Instead, hand them a pair of sunglasses. And so what I want you to do is open a new note on your phone and entitle it, read it when you need it. And so when you feel your imposter syndrome coming up and sneaking into your you know, brain, your body, your sensations are changing, open up that note and read your personal mantra that you just wrote right now. So take a moment to do that. I have done this with many people. And I have gotten many messages later. Thank you so much for doing this. I needed it today. And it really will make a difference when you least expect it. So if you want to learn more about imposter phenomenon, there's some really great resources out there. The two articles that I mentioned are down here from Harvard Business Review. And there's a great podcast on Dare to Lead with Brene Brown, which has Jodi Amburi and Rachika uh, Tulshanye, um, who are the authors of those articles on the podcast. It's wonderful. I highly recommend all three of these if you have the time and the opportunity to explore more about this. And lastly, I just want to say in closing, don't forget you have talent, you are capable, and you belong. And thank you for joining. So now I can take some additional questions. I'll stop sharing as well, too. Um. All right. Recently, I uh, recently I learned not to go uh, to MSU. That is, don't make. Oh yeah, ask for feedback. Don't write your worst case scenario. That's wonderful, and it's interesting when you make things up. It's the story you tell yourself, and I, I love that. Don't write your worst case scenario. You'd be so surprised at how many times people will write their own worst case scenario and will believe it. Every day they will think that's really what the case is. But in actual fact, if you look at the data, it doesn't say that it, it, it does not hold true. 
there's any other questions, please feel free to write them in the question and answer. And I have time now. I left at the end to answer those. I'm definitely a worst case scenario person. <laughs> I know. And it's so interesting when we do that to ourselves, we think we're actually creating situations that will be, make us prepared when in actual fact it does the exact opposite sometimes. Right. Yeah. And then you end up worried more, or at least I do. I've like gotten myself so worked up that I've like ended up with, um, I got hives on my neck when I was doing public speaking. And yeah. yeah. It's interesting too, because it, it allows for you to really kind of examine like how you got there. And I always talk about this. I call it the rumination Valley. Like, so this is an event and this is the rest of our lives. And in between it is where we ruminate and we get stuck in the Valley. And we just spiral and spiral and spiral and beat ourselves up. And that's one of those areas where you can, like you said, you get hives, you can really feel like the sweats, you can feel awful. But if you actually take the time to take a step back and get out of that valley, you're like, oh, why did I do that to myself? Um, it's really interesting to kind of do that. And right, so there's another question. I feel like I've never worked past the feeling of being an imposter. What can I do to change that? So really, I think one of the the biggest lessons from this is it's okay to feel like an imposter, but also it's really not okay to beat yourself up about it. So it's about recognizing that if you feel like you are an imposter, why? Is there any data to support that? And so take the time to slow down and look to see, has anyone ever told you, you have no idea what you're doing? Probably not. Has anyone ever told you that you are a really bad employee? Probably not. Maybe once in our lives, we have a really bad situation at work. It might not be the right job for us. Has anyone ever told you, and I have this happen a lot with like mom guilt, like you're a bad mom. Your children look at you and say, you are failing me as a mother or a father. No, our children remember all the good stuff. They don't remember when we screw up. And I mean, we're going to screw up. Like that's the whole purpose of being alive is if we don't make mistakes and learn from them, we can never value truly when we have succeeded. And so I think one of the really important things to work through, if you feel like you're stuck feeling like an imposter, why are you letting yourself feel that way? And how can you really break that cycle? So for me, it's, you know, if I have an event where I'm really feeling it and I can't let go of it. That's when I reach out to a friend of mine or a colleague and say, hey, I'm suffering from this right now. Can you help me work through this? And because I've done this to other people, they now reach out to me with the same issues when they come up. So, for instance, a colleague of mine was going to speak at an institution she'd never spoken at before, give a presentation on what she's an expert in. But she's never really published anything in it. She has nothing to like show her name, like this big name thing. And she was like, I can't do this. I'm like, yes, you can. I'm like, what are you talking about? But it's also about recognizing that we need help sometime to break that cycle. You can't do it alone. I think that's great advice. Like if you can actually say out loud what your fear is to somebody that you respect, and they go, wait a minute, <laughs> this is right. Yeah, no, I so think that's you, really, right. Yeah, right. that's really powerful. And I it's interesting because when she, when they, that person said it to me, there's actual data from psychological scientists that if you name what you're feeling and say it out loud, it dramatically decreases, and the feeling will only last for two to three minutes. Oh wow, that's well, well that's. That's nice compared to like letting it spin and getting in that valley, right? Yeah. Like two or three yeah. minutes. Yeah. And so if you're able to get yourself to say it out loud or even write it down or read that mantra to help you break where you're at and recognize that you are in the right place, you are the right person and you're right where you're supposed to be and what you have to contribute is important and you're supposed to be able to do that. I have a I have a lot of sisters and we have this expression where we just say, I've got this, I got this, or we'll say, you got this, you know, where we know that one of us may be struggling and we just go, you got this. And you're like, yes, I got this. 
but it's it's also in the support of those around you who know you that makes a huge difference and ultimately that's one of the things i found within the workplace is that many people don't have the ability to say that to themselves in those moments when they're struggling but if they go to a colleague or to a friend and they say what's going on, they'll have that person who looks at them and says whatever their phrase is. But like for you, it was, you got this. And that makes a huge difference. Yeah, I think it's really interesting about what uh, Brene Brown and those two writers talked about, about, you know, our culture and our workplace that's kind of sets us up for these feelings of imposter syndrome where we don't feel like we belong and lots right. of times, it, maybe it isn't even us. It's our environment, yep. frankly. And, you know, you think about us as women, too. Like, you know, we're just coming off of International Women's Day. I mean, as women, we've had a lot of those, you know, struggles as far as workplace and, you know, being, you know, looked at and compensated as, yes. you know, others. So I think, yeah, it could be instilled in us. And and it really is a culture that needs to be changed, especially for women. And I think about part of the reason I am in the positions that I'm in is because I had not only women lifting me up, but men who were also he for she's who said, you know what you're doing, you should do this. And it was, they saw something in me I didn't even see in myself. And that's oftentimes one of the most difficult things. Um, but really can be hard. Oh, any, um, advice for addressing this in teens? Oh, okay. Yes. So one of the biggest things I would suggest in teens is also trying to help them recognize that this is something that if they feel this way, again, to look for the data to support it and not when someone's saying it to them in a hurtful way. So I have seen this unfortunately very 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 much so in high school students um or even middle school students and I sat down with one of them recently and um was asking them basically where did this come from and it was because something hurtful was said to them and so I think really being careful about not only addressing why it started but where it's coming from and how they can break that cycle. And so that's really when I actually deal with this with adults as well, too. It's because of events that happened in their childhood that can lead to this happening longer term. And so recognizing, creating a culture for support and really focusing on that data aspect of it. And if someone like, like, for instance, the instance with the student I was talking with, it was a friend had said something hurtful and they took it to heart. And ultimately, when you go back and looked at it, the friend said something hurtful because they felt insecure and they didn't know how to voice how they were feeling towards their friend. And so I ended up having the students talk to each other and realize that they both were hurting each other without even realizing it. And then this created this feeling of like inadequacy, fraudulence, that they couldn't do anything else. And so it's one of those moments where communication is really, really important to break that down as well, too. Excellent. Yes. And it's they are 100 percent building each other up and tearing each other down. That is very, very true. And honestly, I'm not going to lie. There is a lot of women hating as an adult. Like I say this to a bunch of people I know, like. Sometimes you would think that women would be their own best friends to help them succeed and be successful. And it's the exact opposite. Like women will tear each other down and be catty like that mean girls from the movie. Um, It really can be very, very trying. And so trying to create that, this is the norm where we help each other and talk through our difficulties instead of the exact opposite of that can make a huge difference. Um, And that's my hope. As as we come out of the other side of the pandemic into a new and different world that we, like I said, bringing in that aspect of kindness to ourselves so we can be kind to others. That is, that is a great, um, great 
ending, I really feel like to this event is to talk about kindness and lifting each other up and listening and yeah, building each other and knowing that we are enough. Yeah. And you uh, are amazing. And I appreciate you bringing this topic and your work forward about it. And I hope everybody that attended today and in the future, when they see this recording, that they remember that they're wonderful. And so are you. Thank you so much, Sue. No, I completely agree with that sentiment. It's so important. Thanks again. Have a great night. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Be safe.